Hey everybody, welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast. Today my guest is Mary Murtagh and we are talking media mastery. With a now insatiable and relentless public appetite to know what's happening, when it's happening, without any delay, combined with the growth of technology allowing anyone with a smartphone to become a freelance journalist, the emergency services organisations have needed to take a leaf out of the corporate world's book to ensure when in the full and unforgiving bright light of the public live at the instance that they are both representing the views of their organizations articulately and accurately but most importantly for most we're not about to commit professional suicide every time someone presses record so my guest today mary murtar has spent over a decade working on newspapers magazines as well as online ping-ponging across the uk to new york and in la from club promoter to award-winning senior video journalist winning a couple of awards along the way the highlights include being a globe trotting travel writer, stalking and doorstepping cowboy builders and putting con men out of business. Mary then took a unique skill set and spent four years serving in Specialist Media RAF Reserve Squadron 7644, teaching the armed forces how to set up press conferences, conduct interviews and deal with the media in times of crisis. She used this as a springboard to become an MOD and NATO crisis communications media trainer for an entire decade taking part in two week long overseas military exercises where she simulated embedded media as an exercise scenario deteriorates and turned into an international crisis. She has trained sailors, helicopter pilots, admirals to handle difficult interviews dealing with fatal incidents, mistakes and complex political situations requiring people to justify their military actions. She was then springboarded from this into regular emergency planning exercises covering natural disasters, nuclear submarine leaks and power station catastrophes, producing social media updates, prints and broadcast news items to simulate the media's reaction. These days she trains upwards of 1,000 entrepreneurs every single year via the How to Do Your Own PR workshops, PR mentor and PR consultancy and when they get really good, the Media Interviews Masterclass. The Media Interviews Masterclass clients include most of the top 10 fire and rescue services in the UK, police forces nationwide, university academics, nuclear regulators, researchers working on cures for dementia, big pharmaceuticals, global chemical companies, housing associations and local councils, including many, many more. The best way for you to support the podcast is to go on over and take a look at our partners. We don't pick them arbitrarily. They are there because we believe they can add value to your life. First up is, of course, the wonderful William Wood Watchers. Founded in 2016, William Wood Watches is an award-winning luxury watch company that upcycles rescue service materials in all of their pieces, embedding every watch with a piece of British firefighting history. The iconic logo on every single watch represents the side profile of a 1920s British firefighter's helmet. It signifies heroism and bravery. It's an incredible pleasure to have Johnny, the CEO, and the whole team on board with the podcast. I've had my Valiant Red watch for probably the best part of four years now. I absolutely love it. So go on over to William Wood Watches and check them out. Whether it's the Triumph, the Valiant, the Bronze, or the Chivalrous Collection, there is something for everybody at every single price point. Our final partner of the podcast today is Hikes. Now, the Hikes group actually started in 1948. They did, in fact, start out in the firefighting boots market, but Hikes now supplies armies, fire and rescue, medical, workwear, police, military, hunting, forestry, outdoors. I wear Hikes and I'm doing absolutely everything. If it's training from our operational duties, I'm rocking the Fire Eagles. These are boots that you will see by pretty much every member of the British Firefighter Challenge team. And whether I'm out with the dogs or I'm out with the horses, I'm rocking the Black Eagle Athletic 2.0. If you go over and check these out, these are my absolute favorite boots. And for you, dear listener hikes do a giveaway with the podcast every single month so if you head on over to one of the social channels whether it's youtube instagram facebook you can win yourself a free pair of black eagle adventure 2.2 gtx and when i say free i mean absolutely free there are no funny games there is no postage to pay there's no small print or any silly business so if you really want to support the podcast go on over and check out one of our partners there is something there for everybody I was really excited to get on this conversation with Mary. It's something we all need to be so much more aware of. We cannot hide from the bright lights anymore. The cameras are on us and people are hitting record. So as they say, the best defense is a good offense. Empower yourself, learn the skills, listen in. And I know you were going to take so much from our conversation today. So without further ado, if you are sitting comfortably, let's buckle up for safety and I will see you crazy cats on the other side. ready go for it mary Murtar, welcome to the fat fats podcast how are you doing 
really good. Thanks so much for having me, Pete. <laughs> it's a really pleasure to have you. We first came into contact with each other when I had the privilege of, uh, of attending one of your sessions. And it was kind of a whole surreal thing because it felt like it's the first, it's exactly what I'd been looking for for so long and didn't realize it actually existed and it was something that I could access because I've kind of fumbled my way through a personal development journey of trying to ask better questions and trying to frame things. And it's the difference between obvious and oblivious. I'd never really thought to approach somebody with this level of mastery and not to blow too much smoke up your proverbial bomb, but the experience that, you've, uh, that you're going to share with us today and sort of the stuff that I went through in our intro, for anybody that's unfamiliar, give us a very brief background that will complement my introduction of how you find yourself talking with us today. Well, you and I met earlier this year on uh, the Media Interviews Masterclass. You were wearing your UK ISAR hat, weren't you? So I was indeed. I was training uh, 10 of you over in Lincolnshire, you know, five or six different brigades from across the UK. And you were all doing the Media Interviews Masterclass. So that is getting you from media zero to media hero in terms of being able to do a really good print online ready radio or television interview. Go ahead, Pete, what are you going to say? I was going to say, it's uh, scary how essential this is now becoming. It's something that people used to be petrified of and they felt they would never have to interact with us in the lowly emergency services or in the military unless you were the very tippy top of the the proverbial sword. You wouldn't be required Mm -hmm. to have to use this. But with technology rapidly accelerating and with everybody able to pop up and be a sort of Uh, virtual freelance interviewer and or to reporter why do you think this is becoming so essential for people and the sort of footholds that people can fall into if they don't give this attention and have like a strong offense before they get caught on the back foot well because you can't swerve the media we are going to run that story about your fire service about your police service about your ambulance service with or without you and if you don't have people that are good to go competent confident interviewees that you can put in front of Sky, BBC, ITV, you're actually doing your service a disservice. You all have really good stories to tell. That's one of the things that I always take away whenever I train the blue light service. The stuff that's bread and butter for you guys and girls, you know, the chases, the pulling people out of burning buildings, putting yourself in harm's way, stepping where angels fear to tread. Mm. That is all stuff that you do day in, day out, and you don't really bat an eyelid. And if you layer that on the top, that you've got this natural British self-deprecation, which I, I talk that. about. Um, terrible at that. We are really terrible at that. It is. It's re- and I try and get people to get over that. So I, I make a bit of a joke in the Media Interviews Masterclass when I'm media training people and say, you've got to get in touch with your inner yank. You know, what would an American say about this? They'd be like, woohoo, yeah. we did an amazing rescue. <laughs> yeah, high five, chest bumps, it'd be all over the place there. All of that, you know. And you ask uh, somebody in uniform, uh, either an emergency service or the, or the military, to do that kind of like be, you know, bragging, and they absolutely die inside, they cringe. Mm. But I think there's so much good stuff that goes on in it. In, anybody in uniform is doing extraordinary things most days and you have no idea how to shout about it. Yeah. So one of the things that we tackle in the Media Interviews Masterclass is it's a couple of things that we tackle. We, we give you the skills that you need in order to be able to do an absolutely belting print online radio, radio and television interview. Not just that, we also help you to get out of hot water. So if you get asked a million dollar question that is makes your heart stop in your chest where you think, okay, I don't know what to do with that. We give you the skills, you know, to do that. But we also give you confidence in terms of, you know, if you do get asked by your local radio station to come on and talk about your preparation for mischief night, for example, you know, instead of swerving that, let's have it. Let's embrace it. Let's do it. Let's make that a great opportunity to showcase, show off, and promote the great work that you do, all the stuff that you do when you're not putting out fires or catching bad guys or loading people into the back of ambulances or you're, you're not at war. All of that really good stuff that you do. But it, I come back to this point about you can't swerve it. We will fill the vacuum. So if there is a story about your flu light service, we will go to local councillors. We will talk to Joe Public. We will talk to the unions. We will talk to disgruntled ex-employees and we will fill the story. We will make the story. So if you don't have your say and get your point across, 
we will run the story without you and there's a void. And we've all seen and heard news reports like that where, you know, Company X was unavailable for comment. And everybody listening at home is going, uh-huh, yeah. hiding behind the sofa, <laughs> were they? So you can't, you can't swerve it. One of the analogies I make on, on, uh, in the media interviews masterclass is I talk about you wouldn't expect somebody to be handed the keys to a light aircraft and told, fly me to Amsterdam without having had a flying lesson. That's exactly what you're doing when you're doing a media interview. If you haven't had training for it, you are being handed a grenade with the pin out. And you might get lucky and it might not blow up in your face, but you <laughs> increasingly, the more interviews you do without any sort of training and preparation, the chances are the grenade's going to go off. Absolutely. And bad media interviews can be career ending. They can be career shaping good or in a good or a bad way and but they can also be career ending if you say the wrong thing and you're representing your organization it can be a call from the chief mm. even worse a private meeting with hr where they say you might want to bring your union representative with you oh. and it might involve an <laughs> piece yeah yeah it might involve a p45 so but that is why it's really important mm. that if any blue light service is looking at sort of equipping their people, particularly those that are heading to the top, particularly those that are likely to get asked to do media interviews. So if you get some of your specialism, so you were talking to the Bridgend's extrication team, weren't you, on the Firefights podcast yes. um, earlier this year? Uh, you know, really liked listening to those guys. They are very, very likely to get pinged to do a media interview because what they do is sexy and what they do promotes their brigades. Mm. The other thing to bear in mind is anyone that's sort of working their way up the career ladder, the higher up you go, the more likely you are that this is going to be in your job description. So saying, oh, no, thanks, sir, that, that's not going to wash once you get to a certain level. So I train a lot of, depending on the fire service, I train fire services and I train sort of the top, most of the top 10 fire services across the UK. Some fire services will adopt the approach that we're going to train our senior leadership team and work down. Some will start at watch manager level and work their way up. And there's no right or wrong for that. Sometimes it depends on budget. Sometimes it depends on what the, whether there's been a bad experience with that particular brigade in, in the media. It's really important that this is kind of taken seriously because swerving it, it, it is not an option. So you made a great point there about different levels of services. And, and this kind of echoes back to what we were speaking about at the very beginning in and around the likelihood of people, because this is kind of like a risk analysis thing, and I'm sure everybody from the emergency services, including business, will, will appreciate that. We're talking about likelihoods now. Now, when you talk about businesses, and you all know far better than I will, so please correct me if I'm wrong, they will tend to have some form of request sent in for somebody to come and have an interview or have a, have a chat with somebody. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah, that's often how it starts. Likely a, a formal request. Whereas we, similar to, to all emergency services operators, it's very much a reactive frontline experience whereby somebody, a member of the public, or if you're lucky, somebody that's slightly more professional, will capture you in that moment. And like you've just said there, they're going to get something. They're going to speak to the person who owned the house or they're going to speak to the person that got arrested or they're going to, if they can't get contact with you, they're going to get contact with somebody. They've got to fill that void. They're going to fill it. So where do you, do you feel, because like I say, at the very tippy top, we'd hope that this has already been done and those that haven't, for goodness sake, I mean, you'll, you'll check the notes in, in, in this podcast and you'll be able to get in contact with Mary. But given that the people likely on the ground at the coalface, if you will, they're the ones who are going to likely get that first response, that first interaction. Yeah, what I always say is that you might be the person doing the interview. So, you know, I've done this, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a journalist with 15 years experience. I, I've done this. I've gone up to a cordon and I found the first person in uniform and I've had a chat. Sometimes I've identified myself, sometimes I haven't as a journalist. Yeah, that's um, the scary and bit. That's the petrifying bit. It is. I know it's what we're going to go into, yeah, but it's when it you don't know who you're talking to. Yeah, it is. And I will, I will have a chat and I'll see what I can get out of people. So the word I always use, and this is across all my training. So, you know, when I'm training basic PR skills, so DIY PR skills on my how to do and PR workshop, or right way through to this stuff, which is sort of quite high level media interviews, master classes, the word I always say to people is wary. You need to be wary of the media. And that is me as a card carrying NUJ member, working journalist. I'm telling you, you need to be wary of me. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you're hostile. It doesn't mean that you're rude. It doesn't mean you try and take a swing at me. But it does mean you need to watch your mouth. Yeah. You need to watch your mouth. Part of that is covered in the Media Interviews Masterclass. We talk about preparation being the key to all of this. You know, you never just rock up to a media interview with your fingers crossed, carrying a rabbit's foot <laughs> and hoping that it all goes well. Okay. That is not preparation. Okay. That is juggling the grenade with the pin out that I talked about earlier. Yeah. What you do is you, is you is you prepare. So you never just rock up. You know, you, like you would prepare for an interview or you prepare for a promotion or you'd rehearse if you were going to do a presentation. I don't know, the emergency services show at Olympia, you know, you would rehearse, wouldn't you? You wouldn't Absolutely. just kind of wing it. You know, mm-hmm. there, you know, some really gifted people that can just, you know, rock up and, and give a fantastic speech without any notes. But, you know, those are few and far between. Even and that I isn't, met, isn't really true, is it? Because they've often compounded that experience <laughs> from listening to so many great orators or great conversationalists and knowing how to use their voice as a tool and stuff like that. So even those individuals, people, oh, they've just got it. It's not always the case because they've they've most likely made this a priority. They've seen the power of communication, both the good and the bad. And then, like you say, empowering yourself with how can I how can I use this tool and realize that I'm wielding quite a uh, quite a powerful weapon, really. Yeah, there is. I mean, practice makes perfect with this. I will sometimes see people on the telly that I've trained and I do a very high-pitched squeal at that point and I can't replicate it here because it has to be, it's where I'm taken by surprise. <laughs> yeah. But only dogs can hear it. It's really, it's really squeaky and it's really bad. It's very short. It's like a dog whistle yeah. <laughs> because I get such a professional kick out of that. And I will sometimes watch somebody and be like, blimey, you weren't that good when I trained you. You were good. Yeah. But you weren't that good. And that is practice. That's practice makes perfect. And one of the things I talk about when I'm media training people is, you know, don't do this training and then put it on the shelf. Don't do this training then and just tick the CPD box. You know, let, let's, let's use that training. And this is, it's really, really transferable. I know we're going to come on and talk about this. Massively, but, massively uh, transferable. Yeah. But, I, I think uh, and, so in fact, many situations actually, that in, in life in general, like you say, yeah. we're talking about difficult questions. We're talking about how you articulate yourself, staying on point. And I don't want to tread all over the rest of our conversation, but there is so much crossover. That's why I love it. You know, it's, it's human behavior. That's what we're talking about. Mm. And where do you go where there's not other humans? You know, you're going you're to meet and interact with them mm. every single day. Yeah, it's a, it's a really transferable skill, but I, I'm, I'm not going to, we'll, we'll come on and talk about that at length. So for the true value of, of what we're going to talk about, I know it's hard to do any of this in, in bite-sized forms. And also, I, part of me doesn't want to because I have the privilege of, <laughs> I thought of you as I came away, but my wife asked, uh, how did the media training thing? And I said, you know what, I met this incredible woman, Mary, and she's kind of like poacher turned gamekeeper. <laughs> and I thought, questioned whether mm. or not I was going to say that to you because I thought, yeah, choosing to empower people is is really very kind, you know, because you must see. I mean, we're going to come on to some of them, but just seeing people flailing and drowning in some conversations. Mm-hmm. So, on that note, I want to make sure that we're going to give people a few little bits and pieces, and then we're going to come on to them. But let's start off with a few of the. I know it's hard to even say shortcuts or hacks or some of that low hanging fruit that you see people making the biggest faux pas when they are confronted with the the fast and furious media interview yeah so your voice is really powerful we all know this don't we if you think about great radio that you've listened to or a really good podcast people can transport you they can pick you up and drop you into the middle of a house fire they can pick you up and have you on the deck of a warship they can pick you up and have you in guantanamo bay on a desert island swimming in the caribbean And that's all through your voice, partly what you say, but also how you say it. So you'll know when you're listening back to podcast audio like this, I I talk about give me waves in your audio. If I was listening to your audio back, I want these peaks and troughs in your speech. What I don't want is a flat line. Okay, I want you to sound animated. I want you to sound passionate and non-monotone. So I want you to use dramatic pauses emphasis and basically i need you to get in touch with your inner Lawrence olivier that's what i'm really looking for so that's what that was one of the things i repeated to my wife i said uh, that and then we actually went away and looked at some amateur dramatics style um voice warps and stuff like that and, and i'll be honest with you i did some today I, I do them every time now because you've got to fine tune yeah. that instrument you know 
Yeah, absolutely. We all know, we've all, we, we all think of three or four people that who we listen to, and a lot of those people get asked to do audiobooks, where you could listen to that person all day. And sometimes it's the timbre of their voice. So, you know, Stephen Fry, for example. But, you know, a lot of the time it's people that have worked at it. And that, that's kind of what we need to tap into when you're doing the media interview as, as well. So, you know, I'm going to give you an example here. We're going to pretend that I'm being interviewed um, and I'm a working firefighter. Okay. I'm going to give you two bits of audio, uh, which will make this point, I hope. Uh, so, firefighters have done a fantastic job today, thanks to their skill. And quit thinking, we have a family of four who have escaped a house fire that could easily kill them. Let's take one. Accurate. Okay. It's true. It's honest. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, if you were to read that in quote marks, in print or online, that would work. Yeah. But it doesn't work for radio or telly. So take two. Firefighters have done a fantastic job today. Thanks to their skill and quick thinking, we have a family of four who have escaped a house fire that could have easily killed them. I'm filled with confidence. I know, I know you're going to rescue yeah. my family. And I know, given the same yeah. circumstance again, you would, you would do it emphatically and professionally. Yeah. And if you're doing that for broadcast, you are using your hands if you're a gesticulator. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you're using your head to make a point. Perhaps you're nodding your head or you're tipping your head. It's all of these that sort of non-verbal communication that goes along with it. And Pete, you'll remember from the Media Interviews Masterclass that we did, when you're watching yourself back on that big telly, once you've got over that horrible cringe factor <laughs> that almost <laughs> everybody feels, we're like, oh my God, look at the size <laughs> of my nose. And that's not directed at you. It's just, no, you know, I oh my, a, oh my head, God. Yes, <laughs> it is true. Yeah, Once we get oh past my. the, oh my God, I hate myself. <laughs> I want to just switch the television off after you get off that bit. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Once you get past that bit, you will, this is, and this, this other layer comes in where it's all this nonverbal communication. So it's what you say, but it's also how you say it. So things like a, a tilt of the head, the expression on your face, the rest of your body language, all add layers of authenticity, of trustworthiness, all of those things. And it's a multi-layer thing. That's why broadcast mm. is perhaps the toughest of those. You know, we always start with the print or online uh, interview. Then we move on to radio. Then we move on to TV. And t we're building up our skills as, yeah. the, as the day goes on. So it's really, you know, use your voice as a tool. It's something that, that, people kind of forget to do or have to be trained to do, but it can make a huge, huge, huge difference in terms of your your audio being sticky, your audio then being clipped and used in the eleven o'clock news. It can yeah. it can massively improve the the take up of that of of whether of, of your interview. So you'll often find on say, for example, local radio, BBC local radio, if it's a really good interview, they'll then clip it and then it'll end up on the national radio if it's a good enough story. And partly that is to do with the quality of the interviewee. So that's be, yeah. point number one. Yeah. It's yeah, that moment at the end where they go, it was 17 people. It was 500 degrees. You know, and that, that's the bang. That's the, literally the two, three seconds yeah. that you're hearing it. We thought they were never going to make it. That's it. And that, that's it. Yeah. They're going to hold that bit. Yeah, exactly. And it's, that's the kind of thing that as a, as a, as a working journalist, you actually want to hear that from people. Yeah. I want you I want, to, I'm going to be on your team. You Give me the interview. things you know I want. And I'm on your team then. And I will manipulate yeah. anything you've done wrong. I'm more, I'm more likely to spin that because I want this to be a success story. But if you've not played with me, because I'm here to play it, if you're not going to play with me, I am going to be your worst nightmare. Mm hmm. And I, I'd like to be able to say that doesn't happen, but but it it does, you know. And sometimes that becomes the story, actually, of, of you having a bit of a, either a hissy fit or giving a one word. We'll come on and look at some of those examples later on, I think. But you know, one word, snotty answers. You know, that isn't going to end well. But that's the irony in it as well, isn't it? Because because the, we perpetuate that which we haven't practiced. For example, we've gone, oh, I'm I'm uh, it's beneath me. I don't need to practice. What practice? How I use my voice? I've been speaking since I was two years of age. Thank you. I don't need to practice how I use my voice. Right. Okay. So you haven't focused on it. So then, when you were placed in the position that you feared most, they focused on the fact that you, they knew you hadn't practiced it. You didn't know how to say what you were trying to articulate. And that perpetuates your negative belief that people are out to get you. That they, they, they weren't. You didn't put the prep in. You didn't think this was important mm. and it's cost you. I have trained a couple of people in uniform, military uniform like that. 
You've um, trained hundreds of people in uniform. I mean, I, I know um, you perhaps I have, I have. That, that NATO, yeah. Blumen, MOD, you know, all sorts of different services, you know, researchers, academics, university, armed forces, nationwide. You know, so I think I'll just, sorry, interrupt you, but you're not doing yourself justice there. The impact you've had on a lot of these leaders, I think has been incredible. Sorry. But, but I think there are, I have trained a few people that were like, oh, I don't really need this, you know, we didn't get to my <laughs> stage of my career without, blah, 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 blah. I'll see you in the bar later. That, you know, yes. uh, they're, they're the exception. <laughs> they are the exception, but I have trained a few people like that. And then as part of the training, I have absolutely crucified them yeah. because you cannot do that in a real media interview. You know, what to ask me that for? Well, that's a stupid question. Like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> you are going to end up with egg on your face and I'm going to end up with a Sony award yeah. for the interview. Mm. So let's not, let's not do that. Let's not, let's not, you know, be medically retired uh, through, you know, uh, uh, through doing a lousy media well, interview. And that's kind of probably the one where they can get rid Haven't they indoctrinated into a thing where they've, they've existed in an environment where, no one would challenge them. No one's going to make me look silly because I'm in charge. And they've been mm-hmm. lulled into that false sense of security when they go, oh, we're speaking with uh, Admiral James today. He's led the entire fleet in of hush the tones. entire globe. Yeah. yeah. And then he's like, yes, you're you're welcome. I am here. You're right. I'm, I'm here. And then they go, so why did you think it was acceptable that you left seven people behind on what you believe to be an incredibly risky mission? And they go, how, how dare you ask me something like, well, I'm going to. That's the game we're playing. Sorry if you didn't get the brief. Yeah, that's where the preparation comes in because part of what we cover in the media interviews masterclass is, you know, what happens to those dreadful heart-stopping questions? There is a way. To, there is a way to deal with them. There is a way to deal with them. You can answer that question mm. and come across as a decent human being and as a good representative for your organisation. But if you've not been taught how to use that answering technique, you're stuffed because much of what will come into your head in a way to respond to that will make you give you a shovel so you can dig yourself a bigger hole than you're already in. Yeah. So there isn't any question that a journalist can ask you that you can't handle, but it's that you're not born with this knowledge. Okay. You're not, you're not born knowing how to fight a fire or to, to arrest somebody no. and keep it within the law. You have to learn those things. Then it doesn't matter how senior you are. If you've not had this training or doing media interviews, you need to get it because it's going to land you in hot water yeah. if you're not very careful. So I'm going to bring on to point number two of these, fast and furious media interview tips number two is never say no comment ever so no comment can't comment couldn't possibly comment i want you to purge that from your media interview vocabulary because it's got so tarnished and when i hear no comment i immediately it's got a negative connotation for me it's when i hear it i think you're swerving it you are up to no good You've been briefed to say that. And, there's, you know, when I hear that, my news radar stops twitching. <laughs> what are you not telling me? What's the secret? Uh, what are you hiding? Where is exactly. it? Exactly. I've hit here? Is gold. It under there? What is it? Yeah. I've, hold, I've hit gold. I just need to keep digging. So we're going to purge that from our media interview vocabulary. And the third point is that you're not doing this interview for your colleagues, the top brass or the press office. You're doing it because you've got something to say to the public. A print, online, radio or television interview is merely a conduit for you to talk to your next door neighbour, the barman at your local pub, the mums and dads at your little boys scout group. That's your audience, the public. You know what? Don't you, forget you make a that. great point there, though, because I was going to say, and I know it's um, something we spoke about, um, crossover skills. I see this when a lot of people do even just... They're not even being filmed, but they're doing community events where they're talking to a group from a vulnerable persons group or they're talking to a scout group or something like that. And they start going into, uh, so this is the capacity of the pump and actually the internal diameter of it is this. And if you look, reference back to 1976 when this was, and you're like, no one cares. No one knows what you're talking about. You're losing the audience. Yeah, yeah. That's, we need to, we'll talk about, that it's very much a transferable skill and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on. Don't forget that you need to make your language easy to understand. No jargon. If you find, I know anybody in uniform, you've all got jargon that you use at work to make sure that everybody's on the same page. You can all communicate. Everybody understands what's going on. It is a shorthand. And it's a really, really useful shorthand, particularly sort of in an instant at a fire ground. I, I get it. But yeah. I understand why it's really important. You need to park the jargon outside the radio studio. You've got to use plain, simple language. You need to be relatable, give examples, draw on your vast experience in uniform. 
make my readers, listeners and viewers really warm to you. So that's one of the things we talked about. On We, we managed to get there in the day, didn't we, when we did a media interview yes. masterclass for UK yes. eyes are because... You know, some of the wealth of experience that, that you guys and girls have at UK I mean, every time I train you, I've trained you for the last five years. I, I learn something new because somebody who's been on a different deployment or a different exercise or have a different, a different specialism mm. back in their home brigade brings that. And I learn something every time I train UK eyes are. Mm. And one of the things that we talked about, and I think it got better during the day, the media training day that we, that we did, Pete, was talking, drawing on that experience. You know, it was 35 degree heat. The equipment that we had on us weighs 12 kilos. Okay, that is the weight of a, a suitcase, a medium-sized suitcase. We were pulling people from uh, 60 centimeters of water. That is enough to knock you off your feet. It's all of those kind of uh, yeah. examples yeah. where you're bringing the interview alive. Take them from what they know mm -hmm. to what they don't know. You know, make it relatable exactly. to something already existing in their life. So your conventional oven goes to 280 degrees. It was 900 degrees in that room. Bloody hell. It was exactly. four, four times as yeah, hot as my oven. I can't even touch something yeah. from out my oven. Yeah, that's the kind of colour that we're talking about. That's kind of that's part of what I'm helping people to tap into. You know all this stuff, you have it. But it's there is a tip. What I find is particularly with firefighters because there is such a, a sort of spirit to core, this camaraderie um, and this relentless banter that goes on with firefighters <laughs> yeah. that, that, that people are a bit embarrassed about having the mickey taken out of them oh, by doing gosh. what they might call oh, no. a Janet and John interview. But you know what? They're not your audience. So if you get sent text messages from your colleagues or other people on your watch going, oh, fire hot, you've done your job having listened if they've listened to your interview and you get mickey taking like that on text message you've pretty much done a really good media interview because yeah. you're not there you're not talking to your colleagues you're not talking to the press office you're not talking to the fire chief you're actually talking to the average person on the street and that's what you're trying to communicate so you need to bear that you need to bear that in mind and i think certainly the training course that you were on pete i think we've got better at that throughout uh, throughout the day as the day went on we have some lovely phraseology that people that people came up with and but you just need to bear in mind that that interview is is not something that is for a specialist audience it's for a general audience it's mm. for your next door neighbor i think it's it for comes your from best a, friend who's a fear, not a firefighter it's a fear that they're not interested enough or that that humble aspect slash self-deprecating mm. side of it where they think I need to layer this in complexity to make it remotely interesting to people. And that's not the case mm -hmm. whatsoever. No. People people want to, especially in the emergency services. I mean, I know you do work with, I don't know if maybe the emergency services is your easiest customer, because I know you do a lot of work with entrepreneurs and stuff like that, where they have effect, they've got a more difficult flag to fly sometimes. The emergency services, as you said before, guys, it writes itself. It really does write itself. Just mm -hmm. talk about it most of the time. There's less, mm -hmm. I feel like there's less holes for us to step through. Whereas for the average, um, like you said, John and Jane, trying to celebrate something that they're doing personally that may, um, you know, that may have a financial aspect to it, significantly more difficult. We just need to let go of our need to over complicate things and layer it with all sorts myriad of things that's mostly irrelevant and actually switches people off doesn't make them lean in further to go oh i'm interested in learning more about fire behavior training they just want to know it was hot and unbearable yeah you're right you've, you've hit the nail on the head there are some of the people i work with so i do a lot of pr consultancy for businesses i do a lot of pr training how to do and pr workshops for micro enterprises entrepreneurs graduate entrepreneurs business owners Anybody that wants to know how to get their mush in the paper or on radio, I'm your gal. And I do run workshops that help people tap into that, how to make the most of the media, how to approach them, what they hate, what they don't hate, how to make friends with journalists, what's a story, how to write a press release, those kind of things. And I'd say 95% of the people that come on my courses would kill to have the kind of profile and respect and brand awareness that anybody in uniform has it's such a usp um, it's just it's oh. so you know 80 percent of the hard work is done for us yeah you're knocking at an open door your, your emails are going to get opened your <laughs> yeah. in, your press conferences are going to be attended your press releases are going to get read you have that 
open rate that's far higher than, than it is in the private sector. It's much easier for you to get a media interview and to raise your media profile. And, and I, I actually think they that... They present themselves all the time. Opportunities for a, a good demonstration are there all the time because incidents continually happen. You don't have to create the storm. The storm is consistently ongoing. You just need to keep showing up and, and delivering value, which is it's in, it's in the black and white anyway. Yeah. I mean, you are beating great stories off with a stick beating them off with a stick. I mean, one of the things that I do in the How to Do NPR workshop is get people brainstorming what are the stories in your business, how to come up with a killer line, what's the top line in your story, what's the intro. You know, people have to do the work. They really have to do the work. Mm. For you guys and girls, the, the story is leaping off the page. Journalists have their tongues hanging out waiting for that story. That puts you in a unique position. And it's true for, I would say, all of the emergency services, any blue light service. It's somewhat true for, for the military. Mm. Um, the private sector, it's much harder. I mean, I, I earn my money when I'm trying to get media attention for PR clients and for and teaching people how to get media coverage for themselves through the How to Do NPR workshop. I earn my money because sometimes you are selling something that is, is, is newsworthy-ish. It's not the kind of thing that's show-stopping like, like you guys and girls do every every single day. So I think mm. there is a, it puts you in a, in a unique position. I mean, to come back to an earlier question you were talking about, you know, that they're my easiest clients. You, you, you are, I mean, you're my favorite clients. Just don't tell anybody else. Okay. <laughs> Just between you, me, and the blue light services, you're my favorite client. Why? Well, a couple of things. You really am embrace training. You do so much of it. You're very receptive to it. You turn up on time. You don't sit at the back playing with your phone, sulking because you've got work to do and you shouldn't really be here. Right? You never have that attitude. You normally, you know, pretty can do. You're very good at taking constructive criticism. Normally, when everyone else takes the mickey out of you, the rest of your cohort, the other nine delegates will take the mickey. Yeah. So you're very good at taking criticism on the chin, even when it can be quite harsh. So you'll, you'll know myself, you'll know yourself, Pete, from the, Mm. TV debriefs we did. Oh, I yeah. don't pull any punches. No, if you create crap, a very I'm very good environment so. though. You, you, I've felt very safe. Well, that's interesting to hear. I would like to say so. I would like. To, I would like to think so. But I'm interested to hear what, 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 why you say that. Because you were so open in the in examples of how it was done poorly, and you left me reassured with no matter what faux pas I might commit, I knew that we had the tools in the room because of what you'd gone through and what's what's contained within the, the media mastery course. And I'd already picked up so many of them. You know, one of the things when you said about favorite customers, I wondered if it was because there's such a massive from and to story as well. Because a lot of people that operate in the entrepreneur world know this is going to be part of getting themselves out there getting news getting exposure making sales we so many of people in the emergency services have never wanted to do that i'm kind of in a mm. weird middle ground because it's, it's part yeah. of the podcast You're struggling those worlds aren't you <laughs> yeah there's um there is such a huge from and to in the room when you were there with us but you'd created such an environment where people felt safe because you'd already gone first you'd already made it very laid back you weren't doing it live and, you know, you made it very clear none of, none of the stuff that you were recording was going to get used afterwards. And people felt very, very reassured. You know, I know we took a sort of five minute break to prep without going into too much detail. We, we prepped our agendas and all this sorts of stuff and what we were going to discuss. And then people came into the room excited. There was actually a lot of optimism versus the beginning of the day where I'm going to take some notes, but it's not really my sort of thing. It was something I heard from a few people, whereas everybody get up and it was incredible to see. I love to see that growth journey. When you can see the bookends of both ends of the day, it's not like they're going to go away mm -hmm. and work on it and come back in a week. You see such a transformation in what was probably only eight or nine hours worth of, of time. And it was incredible to see people's confidence go dramatically, um, you know, skyward. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's good to hear. I think um, that's interesting that at the beginning of the day, well, you know, I'm here because I need to be, I'll we'll see how it goes. And then you are, I'm, I've converted people. That gives me a huge amount of professional satisfaction. And you know, I'm not really into humiliation, telling war stories, you know, when I was in Afghanistan. You know, that doesn't <laughs> teach you anything. You know, that, if, go and be an after-dinner speaker if that's your, if that's your jam. Yeah. Um, I'm very much there to take people on a journey with me that even if they come in, they're frightened, they hate the media, they don't see what's the, what's the bloody point in this, that I bring them with me and that you can see them sort of the frown softening as the day goes on because they're like, oh, actually, this could be really useful. And this is where the transferable skills come in. It's why I was talking about these transferable skills. 
that even if you're not going to use it in uniform, there's loads of other places you can use it. So I love that sort of learning journey that, that I take people on. And, you know, God, life saving, sticking your neck out, rushing in where angels appear to tread is your daily bread and butter. I mean, often those in uniform don't realize how much of an appetite there is from the media to hear those stories. Mm. You genuinely have the public's trust, you have their affection, and you have their admiration in spades. And actually teaching 999 personnel to talk to the media is hugely professionally rewarding mm. for me because you make the great interviewees. Do you know what, you though? Keen I, I want to double click on mm. that because there's a, there's a massive growing fear within me, and this is kind of the whole reason for the podcast, is because and I, and I feel so blessed to have made, I'd made contact with you because I genuinely feel our pride is like, pride's both our greatest strength, but it's also one of our biggest weaknesses. And some people are too proud to speak about what they do. And I know we're, we're echoing back over a, a subject covered, but we are going to successfully make ourselves insignificant if we are really not careful. The great stories and the the reason people join the emergency services a lot of time, fire, ambulance, military, police, whatever it may be, is because they've seen or heard an example of what that means. They have a picture in their mind of what it is to be a frontline worker, what it is to be a protector of the peace, you know, wear that badge, be a police officer, rescuing somebody, giving them CPR on the back of an ambulance or running into a fire. They have got that story from somewhere. And I think that we went from a period of freedom where we talked openly about this, then one or two people got scorned probably through their own lack of awareness. And the pendulum has swung, not so much now, because we're becoming more open. I mean, if we weren't, then I wouldn't have a job because you know somebody would have said, you're not allowed to do that, don't do that, who are you? So the pendulum is swinging, but I feel like we've laid a layer of concrete over that seed and if we don't nurture it if we don't pour the development on it in like the work that you do everything is progressing there's so much noise in the world and if we want to stay significant and relevant and for people that are listening at a chief fire officer level and above if they want funding to show community and the Mm -hmm. government that we are essential we stand for more than just running into fires we are a we're a source of good we're a source of moral value in the community police fire ambulance militia all of the people that work in those industries but if we don't do more of this We are going to become insignificant. And I'm petrified of that. And I I just say that because you say people have so much affection. And they do, if they remember. And it's not like we Mm. should stand there on our high and mighty and go, don't you know what the emergency services does for you? And we're like, who are you? Who are you again, sorry? What have you done? Mm. Because Mm. we've been too proud about it. I mean, I think the pandemic shone that, uh, shone a light on that. All the stuff that, I mean, I was training one of the fire and rescue services in the Northwest in the midst of the pandemic and all the stuff that they were doing that had nothing to do with the fire service. They were just mucking in. They were key workers. Yeah. They were had people they had they were doing delivering medication. They were going into care homes. I mean it's yeah. just phenomenal what they were doing. And yeah. nobody knew about it. All the stuff that you do around inspections. Mm. And going into building premises. Well, this, this is a highly skilled team. You know, the, we're, we're the master <clears throat> problem solvers, people that work in the emergency services, they've been trained that mm. way. They've dealt with those instances. But that master problem solver with that toolkit, both mentally and, and, you know, physically and all the tools and resources that we have at our disposal, we can be the solution to so many things. I would love for communities and governments to think, I've got a problem. And not not for them to say, oh, we've got a fire or we've got a terrorist on the run, therefore we need the police. Authority. It was, I've, we've got a problem. We've got a challenge in the community. Let's include the emergency services. Let's ask them what their approach is because they are masters of risk analysis. They're masters of innovation. They're masters of resourcefulness and going above and beyond. Not just defining ourselves solely as the, the very small specifics of the role. The wider aspect of, what can our collective, this is why, you know, when, when you see, and I'm sure you speak with you know, companies and CEOs when you train them, there's so much of their skills that can be applied to different businesses, whether they know. And this is why we are seeing people from the public, of uh, the private sector, sorry, coming into the public sector and leading services, you know, chiefs of mm-hmm. police, and because they're now running a multi-million pound company and we need to be relevant. We need to be able to show people what we're doing. Yeah, you need to show people what you're doing when you're not putting out fires because there's a lot that I think people know you put out fires, right, number one. But a smaller proportion know that you go out to road traffic collisions and then they're like, you're playing snooker the rest of the time, right? Having a sleep. That's it. Playing cards. It's like, no, 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 no. Okay, so you can't get uppity about that if you're not doing media interviews about the stuff that you're doing when you're not putting out fires and going to RTCs. Mm. So 
it's all of that prevention stuff. It's all that outreach stuff. It's the community stuff that you do. A lot of your fire stations now are community hubs. I know a lot of fire and rescue service stations in Merseyside are community hubs. You've oh, got people do. come in we 24-7. Host vulnerable persons yes. groups for force yes. prevention, for people that are aging in the community, for people of poor financial circumstances, and we'll host even lo- local entrepreneurs to come and teach people about how to become more sustainable in their life. And Because that helps us, because we then talk about people being um, vulnerable in the home because they're financially vulnerable. They can't fuel their home. They can't pay for things. And that ev- inevitably, and people go, well, what the hell has that got to do with emergency services? Because somebody that's vulnerable financially their life will tend to deteriorate to a point where they don't care for themselves very well that results mm. in them not caring for themselves very well in the home and that will eventually result in some sort of hoarding or isolation or mental or physical distress where we will get called out because they've hurt themselves they've tried to hurt somebody else or they've become unfocused about life to the point where They've just become dangerous and we know the end destination. Again, the media is full of these stories where they go, where was the emergency service? Where was the intervention? Where was social services? Where was the government? Where did these people work? You know, you know what? We could help as well. We've got a tremendous amount of resources. And like you said, we do it already. We just don't talk about it. I, I want to hear an interview about that because I think your audience is going to be like nodding, going, yeah, I know we do that. You ask your next door neighbour, you ask your barmaid at your local pub, they won't know about that. They won't know about all that amazing prevention stuff about catching people so they don't slip through the cracks. They won't know. I genuinely, they won't know about it. No, they won't. You're right. So the last 30 seconds, that that right there, you know, that's a press release waiting to be written that that, that goes out from from your brigade. So that's a story waiting to happen. You that would that would be of interest to the media. Particularly if you had a couple of case studies. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. It's about tapping into all that stuff that you do when you're not doing your the third, the top three things that people think about when they think of what you do for a living. And if you don't tell those stories, they're going to go untold. And just to kind of take you back to, to you know why I like training people in uniform, and this is a little bit sort of I'm being very honest. We always have a real laugh, and that that really helps yeah. because there is always Mickey taking banter. I, there is always somebody and I have a personal bet with myself on how long it will take a firefighter or a copper to quit space for radio about a colleague <laughs> doing a telly <laughs> yeah. right? I just, honestly, it, there's, I a re- there's a it's reason like we don't it, do the visual on the podcast and that's not because exactly. we don't have so, attractive guests, I promise you. <laughs> But it's, that is the face for radio quip bingo that I play with myself because there is always, but it's never, it's never nasty. It's always done in the spirit of, of camaraderie, etc. And actually, that makes you a really great, a great group of people to, you know, mm. to it train. Down I the mean, barriers, I, I, it? it does. It absolutely does. And you know, everybody has to stand in. You know, I mean, I've trained people where you've got the fire chief in the room, and then all the senior leadership team, and then a few people that are coming up the ranks. So you know, there's like big jumps in pay grade in the room yeah. but everybody has to go in front of me and face the mic and everybody has to go in front of me and the record button comes on the big scary broadcast quality tele, a tele, a tele camera so regardless of rank you have to go through that nerve-wracking process so there is a great sort of spirit of solidarity in, in, in the training I mean like I say I, I train a lot of blue light services but I am on a mission to become the go-to media trainer for the blue light services because Every blue light service that I train, I become a better media trainer because I learn something new. I can share experiences. I can say, well, you know, not I don't name anybody, but I'll say, well, I trained a, a brigade last week that did this. And people are, oh, right, okay. Or I heard this really, really good key message that somebody yeah. came up with from UK ISAR. So you'll remember from the Media Interviews Masterclass that you came along to that I've got this greatest hit of UK ISAR key messages. Of, yes. that you can deploy in any media interview okay and that's all come from the 50 or 60 UK ISAR members that I've trained over the last five or six years you guys and girls have come up with them that was and when I've heard mine. them I'm like that was an absolute goal, goal. And, 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 there's, and again yeah. talk about crossover a lot of that can be re- replicated and adapted and empowers people with those words those phrases those go-to almost handles when they feel the conversation yeah. rocking and, and the storms start mm. chopping they can hold mm. on to those handles and bang it's in the back pocket bang it's there and it's gold dust yeah it is it's really i mean i, I could train the emergency services all day long every day every week every month every year i, ge- I genuinely could we spoke earlier about some uh, some of the real faux pas, and you've been kind enough to grace us with a few examples, which my large ape-like hands have managed to fumble through the technology <laughs> and manipulate for us to, to share with people. So these are all available on YouTube. They're all quite short. 
and they articulate a specific behavior would that be right in saying that mm. we are and some mm. people may roll their Shining eyes when, when they hear one or two of them um, and some of them haven't been exaggerated they're, they're genuine ones and people can find these on youtube but they might think to themselves oh, i couldn't see me or someone else doing that in the fire service but there's lots of crossover from every single example mm. would you feel appropriate to brief us on what we're looking out for or would you like to roll straight into it's ginger baker is the first one we're going to share isn't it it is yeah, I mean, I, I use Royal Life Examples in the media interview masterclass. We watch tele clips, we listen to audio for good and bad practice because sometimes the concepts on training can be a bit abstract until you see them applied. Yeah. So I found these are not the car crash interviews that I use in the media interviews masterclass. I use others, but they, I, I came across these and they're really, really useful. I'm, I'm going to, I need to, I'll give people the sort of the, 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 the framework for it and then I'll let people draw their own conclusions and I'll, I'll, I'll identify what I think are the learning points from those interviews. But the first one is a, a, a Guardian interview with the drummer Ginger Baker. Um, and it's one of those Guardian interviews. Obviously, the Guardian is, is print and online, but, you know, as I talk about in the media interviews masterclass and I talk about in how to do NPR workshops, the media is changing and it's not enough to be a print journalist with 100 words a minute shorthand anymore. No. They're expected to be podcasters, they're expected to be infographic experts, they're expected to be social media boffins. Often, print and online journalists will also be quite accomplished broadcasters, but they'll be doing it all on their iPhone. Yeah. So this line between, oh, it's print only and it's digital only or it's broadcast only, those lines are getting very, very blurry. So this is an interview by a Guardian journalist that's being filmed. So effectively, it's the broadcast interview. So I'm going to let you take it away and, and we'll, we can listen mm. to everybody's toes curling collectively as they listen to this interview. <laughs> I would add as well, this is a very kind interviewer. This person is, mm. is on side. They want to get the best out of this person. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's only, it's only about 48 seconds long. So we'll uh, listen in. In the film... Your time in Africa was obviously very, very important to you. Was that when you felt most musically fulfilled? When what? Who? Your, yeah. t your time in Africa. You, it, it seems from the film to be very, very important to you. Was it? Why? <laughs> you, you, you speak about the musicians and the music with such warmth. Totally silly questions, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I... I it, it was. Uh, I just went there. I didn't go there for any particular musical education or anything like that. I mean, that occurred years before I went there. Anyone have a question here? I do, I do have more. I do have more silly questions. That was done in front of a bit of a, of a live audience, and it was actually a very kind interview. I'm not saying that they're not all kind, but that that person was. Um, throwing up the the softball in quite a nice way um, for him, and mm -hmm. it, it didn't seem to they didn't seem to work in together at all. The rapport wasn't fantastic there. No, I mean, I'm listening to that, and I'm feeling so sorry for that journalist, and my toes are curling. What is he doing there? <laughs> what is Ginger Baker doing there? He clearly doesn't want to be there. And there's a slight, a slightly sneery, or oh, you stupid boy kind of approach in response. You know, and that's part of his answer. He does actually have an answer to yeah. this question. It's not going to set the world on fire. It's not going to be a sound bite. It's not brilliant. I wouldn't highlight it as an example of good practice in the media interviews masterclass. But that's a dangerous game to play mm. because you're right. You've got a nice journalist who's just trying to get that interview over the yeah. line. It's right in front of a live audience. Mm. It felt to me He's like he was trying to, to be a little bit too him. clever. And uh, he almost tried to belittle him. And uh, if if you, you know, be careful what you wish for, you turn an interviewer against you, they have got the tools and resources that they can uh, very quickly flip on their head and become an absolute mm -hmm. pest. Mm, yeah, we, you know, don't get off on the wrong foot like that with journalists. If you don't want to do the interview, you shouldn't be there. That, you know, that, that, that's the, the learning point number one. Learning point number two, don't be a smart ass. Don't, you know, oh. In fact, you know, yeah. when I ask you a question, because at the end of the day, we can absolutely publicly crucify you and make you look like a total moron if we choose to. Yeah. That is a dangerous game. If you don't want to be there and you don't want to do the interviews, then, then don't do it. 
Well, like I say, you did, and it was, it was a great story they were trying to share. Um, for anybody that goes over and looks at that YouTube, the content they were they were doing it in front of a live audience because it was quite a nice, prestigious thing to to talk about. And they're asking him about like slight like charitable work that the guys are doing in Africa. He could have simply paraphrased it back and just acknowledged mm-hmm. it and, and added his own little bit on the end. It wouldn't have taken a lot, and he turned it into a very, no. very, very difficult conversation. No, it it didn't need to be like that, and and the you know that that that's got that's not just for those of you that are joining halfway through the podcast. This clip is not good practice. It's an example of very 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 <laughs> bad practice. It will backfire on you. Mm. Um, it's not to be advised. You know, you can you know if you want to be a diva, you know, then a media interview is not yeah. the time to be to be a diva. Because and there it will is crossover there. You. There's crossover into it, like you say, in the emergency services, <laughs> if it were a police officer or even a firefighter, when they're saying, oh, so I see the, the people are still rolling up the hose, they've just finished about the incident. Was it a tough one? And they'll go, of course it was tough. Somebody died, you know, with the rolling up the hose because it needs to go back on the fire engine. You know, if you caught yourself in a bad mood, you could very quickly mm-hmm. turn that person against you they were just that was the first question i think or it may have been very an early on question that guy was asking um setting it up for some more valuable sharing which is a lot of what people will do or mm-hmm. you know you went to this incident today tell us about it if you start off on the wrong foot it's going to get nasty mm-hmm. it's not going to come out well whatever you think yeah. you've said it'll get spun and turned mm-hmm. and tweaked and cut yeah yeah you just look like a petulant toddler <laughs> uh, and that's not a good look in media interviews uh, the the <laughs> second one I'm not sure if the second one is my absolute favourite. I think it is. Um, mm-hmm. The other two examples that we're giving are certainly more cringeworthy, but this one um, echoes to a very different thing that people need to be very aware of. The second one is, um, just for your uh, memory, it's the Sainsbury's CEO, I think. Yeah, so it's the Sainsbury's CEO um, in the middle of when they were trying to take over Asda. And he is doing a remote interview. So a remote interview, and that's one thing we talk about in the Media Interviews Masterclass, have their own set of challenges and opportunities. Remote interview is where you're, you are in a different place to the reporter. So you are perhaps in a street. So for example, you might be in Lancashire, in BBC Radio Lancashire's booth. You're in radio, BBC Radio Lancashire, you're in a tiny little box and you are talking straight into a camera and your interview is then live on the lunchtime news. So that's a remote interview, a t- broadcast interview, where you're in a different place to the reporter and there isn't a reporter with you. And Very familiar is, for people that have experienced the last 18 months where they're similar to us today, coming onto a Zoom call, yeah. they are going onto a thing, mm-hmm. oh, we just we just need to get the feed right first and then we're going to go live at some point mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we're recording yeah. later, I don't know when. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. The minute you see a camera with a red light whenever there's a reporter in the room, whenever you see a mic, you are on your guard. You are treat it as if everything you say, think and communicate non verbally is on camera and mm-hmm. it's being recorded. So this was the Sainsbury's CEO about to do a remote interview. It looked like it was national telly, so he was somewhere <laughs> different from you know, so really big high stakes here. He's negotiating a really big business contract. Just listen to the clip. Money, the sky is sunny. Let's send it, lend it, rend it, rolling along. We're in the money, the sky is sunny. Let's lend it, spend it, send it, rolling along. I love that. I love that one. I almost feel like the sigh at the end really puts a great full stop on the whole thing as well. It just, you know, if he'd been singing Amazing Grace. Oh, no. Or <laughs> it, it wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered. It's the fact that he's singing that song. And that was the story. That became the story. Yeah. The actual interview kind of got yeah. forgotten. That we actually became that sort of like gap. That. It's a little bit like when you get a bad photo <clears> taken <throat> of yourself. We can attach anything to it. We can say, oh, look how look how sad Mary is because she's going to lose yeah. her job. Or look how excited Pete yeah. is after those two people have just been killed. Well, well he'd just mm. been given a free pizza by a member of the public you know but it doesn't matter people are hearing that Mm. and you could like you say you can make your own connections wherever you want to make them yeah but you know that is the the learning point from that is you approach media interview the minute you step into that booth the minute you cross the threshold of a radio studio interview the minute you shake hands with a print reporter you're on the record nothing you say 
can be disregarded. So this is where, you know, you just need to watch the banter. You need to watch the joking. You need to watch the (laughs) unofficial off the record briefings, right? There's no such thing as off the record. You know, you just need to be wary. This word wary again, okay? You you need to be, you need to be wary. I love journalists. I am one. Most of my friends, I'm married to one. Most of my friends are journalists, but I would still advise wariness. And this is a really good example. You need to have adrenaline pumping. Mm. You need to be on point. You need to be on your toes when there's a media interview and not just when, and we're live. The bit before that's really important as well. And and this guy who was probably media trained at Wazoo oh, fell gotcha. foul of that. You'd hope so. He'd have been prepped yeah, and, you'd hope so. and everything like that. And, Absolutely. And- He'd been really, really well prepared and was probably, you know, uh, very well trained and does lots of media interviews. But it just goes to show that, that, that even people who are very good at this can sometimes make mistakes. So, uh, you know, these are the learning points for everybody that are list- that's listening. And definitely for, like, say, for the emergency services, you're not going to get a free ticket just because, well, you're not going to embarrass me, are you? Because, you know, we're here for a, we're here for a good cause. Yeah, I know, yeah. but I'm, I'm here to get something that's newsworthy. I want to be the, mm-hmm. the reporter that got the thing that got then got picked up by national press from my local thing. I want to be that person. So I'm going to take mm-hmm. whatever you give me and don't fall mm-hmm. into that lull of, Hi there. So we're not we're not going on now, and I know this is just your personal opinion, but can you just tell me what you think of this? I know it's not you. Whatever you say after that, they can use it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they can use it. Don't get lured into yeah. that. I always thought. Um, yeah, yeah. I know you share some wonderful examples. We just we're just doing these three, but John Prescott was always a hilarious one. He did yeah. so much of this. Yeah, immediate <laughs> darling for this. God. Yeah, but it always great value. Yeah. Oh, um. So the final yeah. one. I think the final one. Maybe most accurate for those maybe senior level individuals who have heard the first two and maybe gone, oh, you know, I would never do that. I would never do that. You know what? You're definitely going to do this last one if you don't prepare mm-hmm. well for it. Because this this one is, it's an interview with Diane Abbott and it's quite a intense, high profile one. Would I be right in describing mm-hmm. it as that? Yeah, it's, it's LBC. Nick Ferrari, so, you know, quite a formidable interviewer. You know, a lot of stuff that goes out on, say, L- uh, LBC will then get picked up yeah. by National because it's, a, you know, it's well-respected. It's the same with Five Live. It's well-respected. Sometimes stuff that people say on there then then becomes a story. Yeah. It was to do with policing and increasing policing numbers, etc. And I, I think Diane Abbott was, she's there as a government spokesperson. Yeah. Listen, you know, listen to the interview and, and tell me what, you know, what you think's wrong. There we go police uh, men and women over a four-year period we believe it'll be about three hundred thousand pounds three hundred thousand pounds sorry three thousand police officers what are you saying them <laughs> no i mean sorry how much will they cost they will cost they will it will cost um about about £80 million. Pounds. About £80 million? Yeah. Pounds. Right. How do you get to that figure? We get to that figure because we anticipate recruiting 25,000 police, extra police officers a year at least over a period of four years. And we're looking at both what average police wages are generally, but also specifically police wages in London. And this will be funded by the reversing, in some instances, I think, the cuts to capital gains tax. But I'm right in saying that since Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the party, that money has also been promised to reverse uh, cut, spending cuts in education, spending cuts in arts, spending cuts in sports. The Conservatives would say you spent this money already, Diane Abbott. Well, the Conservatives would say that. We've not promised the money to any area. We've just pointed out that the cuts in capital gains tax will cost the taxpayer over two billion pounds and there are better ways of spending that money but as we roll out our manifesto process we are specific- scary numbers <laughs> scary questions <laughs> and even scarier response, yeah. responses at times yeah this is it's a high octane interview um it's a it's a it's a formidable interviewer it's high stakes you know that's an interview where you're supposed to be top of your game is it, what that speaks to is lack of preparation yeah. not knowing your your subject, not knowing your briefing notes inside out. You can hear rustling of paper in the background yes. at Diane the Abbott's panic, end. Where the she's panic in, ensues. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She's desperately looking for that. Now, that's not 
um, I dare say she prepared for that interview, but not enough to have those. You need to know it inside out. You need yeah. to be able to prepare. Especially I mean, if you're using numbers. If you're using numbers, that's scary. For anybody yeah. with their quick maths, that averaged out to £30 they were going to pay every police officer uh, every exactly. year. If you're going to use numbers, yeah. oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Make sure they stand up to scrutiny. Absolutely. And it, it basically is just a lack of, that her. She probably did prepare, but it wasn't. she wasn't prepared enough because... She went into that interview not being able to give a really robust interview. Yeah. And, that, and, that is, and actually, that became the story, actually. I do remember reading headlines at the time that it yeah. was kind of, you know, Dan fluffs yeah. it. Just incompetence. Um, and, and I, doesn't know what the right hand's doing. And also, you exactly. know, when you talk about those numbers, <clears throat> sometimes it can just be a case of mirroring it back. Preparation is key. I think you've got to go into a media interview like you would uh, if you're going in for a job interview where you've got to be prepared to handle the unexpected to think on your feet and you go back to that security of knowing you know I have really prepared a really good interview roadmap for this interview I, I know what I want to say I know what I want to communicate to the public and, I, and I'm going to make sure that I get all my preparation off the page all my key messages said and repeated I'm going to make sure that I do that and that comes from just really good preparation and practice do you know what I have um I've subconsciously and I know we, we've still got more to go but for having been on your course, and I articulate this quite specifically because I don't want to give away some of the incredible content we went through. Where I felt privileged to, to be there with you today. But you have, I'm, and again, I'm sure you planned and prepared for it. You are doing a fantastic job of every point and everything we speak about. Uh, there's lots of patterns I see when I listen to you, mm-hmm. and it makes it very easy to listen to because I, you, you are ironically walking the walk and talking the talk, if that makes sense. We talk about mm-hmm. those subjects and we talk about that agenda. It's a, it's a, it's a tap dancing masterclass. Now, um, so much of this, we spoke about crossover earlier, and I want to I now echo back to it after we've gone through some of those points, because this is massively transferable to different aspects of people's lives at different levels, whether or not you feel you have or haven't got time to prepare, i.e. the frontline responder that's just getting caught off guard on the back mm-hmm. foot, or interactions in your general life family, children, groups of people speaking in general, getting your point across and, and how to communicate powerfully. Um, so what are some of those overarching transferable skills that we've spoken about today? Oh, this, it, God, it can help you get promoted. It, you can handle a tricky public meeting, boost your CV. Um, often I find that people that I've trained, particularly if they're fairly early on in their career, sometimes people email me to say, I just got interviewed for X. I spent 15 minutes at the interview talking about my media interviews masterclass and how that might be brought to bear for this new company or organization. Mm. Thanks. Mm. Um, it needs to go, it needs to go on your CV. Um, you will find that stuff outside your job. So, um, I have had a couple of occasions where I've been listening to radio and somebody has popped up on the radio and they're talking about sport, the importance of sport, or they're talking about, um, girl guiding or Chari- they're talking the charity about event that they're doing on the weekend yeah yeah they're doing some mad you know three peaks challenge and the name rings a bell and i'm like i trained them and i trained <laughs> them in the private sector or the public sector and they're not doing it wearing that badge they're doing it because they've used that transferable skill and have applied it to something outside their job yeah. so that could be pta sports club charity work it is a skill for life. And if you've ever had to deal with, you know, I've reported on public meetings and I do know that public meetings do attract people that are looking for free tea and coffee oh, and a warm. God. I've seen a few where people it, are in, you know, mm-hmm. they're going through strikes and then they're closing fire stations or they're remo- removing funding for police. And that local member of the community has done four days of research and they stand up with the papers in their hand and bang, they throw it at the, you know, the local police officer or the panel, the, the panel mm-hmm. or the chief fire officer mm-hmm. or, and you're like, Oh God. And they won't sit down. They won't be quiet. You're like, <laughs> Oh God. We love those people. As journalists, we make a beeline for those people. Yeah. We call them Hi the there, sir. I'd like to we ask call you, them. you, know, you won't give an opportunity to talk there. So I'd love you to now tell me what you were trying to say. Elaborate. They tried to quiet you, didn't on. they? <laughs> Yes, they try to silence you. We call those, unaffectionately, the Green Ink Brigade. So these are people that write into newspapers with green ink, okay? We love them because they also can tell you about UFO sightings. 
Um, yes. they're, they're great value because you'll always <laughs> be able to get a soundbite out of them. Now, I feel, you know, I've been to public meetings where I've actually felt sorry for the council official or the copper or the PCSO, oh, no. you know, or, you know, the comms person that's had to navigate that. I do because they don't play by the rules. Journalists, there are some loose rules. Public yeah. haven't read that rule book. They are mavericks. They're rogues. Now, this is what their 15 do do, seconds of fame, and they are going to milk it. it. Not gonna, they are, they are going to make sure they get on Granada reports if it kills them. Yeah. So we are, I, I, underst- I do understand that. That is where your media skills, you'll be like, oh, my God, I'm going to use that technique that Mary taught in the Media Interviews Masterclass to shut this down. Yeah. And it will come to you in a blinding flash of light, and you will use that technique, and you will... I've used it. Make sure you, I've used it loads of times already. When people, even just people ask me, "What's you? the podcast about?" and I'll go bang, 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 and they'll say, "Give me a question back," and then it's straight into it again. It's that pattern. It's that pattern, and I and I know people are going to jump yeah. in the notes because they want to know, and I, know, I appreciate we'll leave them on a cliffhanger, but it's for a reason because you've spent twenty years accumulating this knowledge. Yeah, I have. I ain't giving it away for free, people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really, it's a very, very useful skill, and and often you'll find that, that you perhaps used it in not in a media interview as much, you, you won't use those skills in a media interview as much as you'll use them in other bits of your life so oh, yeah. Yeah. you might find Pete that you use it a lot more wearing your firefighters podcast hat I use it with parenting your... I use it in podcasting I use it in communicating with parenting, people I like that in, one. In, oh, parenting massively you know, you want to capture mm. an audience and get a clear message across. If that's not, and you want to know mm. how to do it with brevity and not lose the audience. Mm. If that's not parenting, yeah. then I don't, and I'm not an expert. I'm certainly <laughs> not going to write a book on parenting. But <laughs> this has certainly given me so many tools for that. I mean, you can end up as the you can end up as the poster boy or girl for your WR, your boxing club, your church group, your scout group, and 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 they are really really useful skills. It's a really really transferable thing. It's not just the media interviews. It can, it is basically a skill for a bit like first aid. Mm. You never know when you're going to need to use it and deploy it. And it's and if you've got it, it can be super, super useful. Now, on that point of um, – because a lot of what we're talking about here and a lot of what we talk about on the podcast in general is personal development. And given that you are the walk the walk and talk the talk, you know, so you've demonstrated that today in some of the ways that we've spoken about. But I wanted to ask you a few just sort of personal questions as we close. So given all of the experience that you've had – but I know secretly now, I haven't had a few emails and phone calls with you, you still have that itch of the eternal student. What does personal development look like for you in your life at the moment? And how does it play a role? Well, the, the pandemic has forced us, I mean, has forced us to think outside the box. I mean, you know, as a business owner and an entrepreneur, if I don't innovate, I'm going to become obsolete and no one's going to want to book a house to do and PR workshop or a media mm. interviews masterclass because what I'm teaching isn't relevant anymore. So, you know, I'm constantly having to, um, you know, up my game in terms of the content for those courses. So, you know, how to do a PR workshop, I'm, ha- I'm, I'm introducing things like multimedia techniques. So yeah. how to get journalists interested is not just enough to have a great press release anymore. You've got to think podcast. And in likewise, in the Media Interviews Masterclass, all of, you know, two years ago, I introduced literally overnight Zoom training because more and more broadcast interviews are now Zoom. You'll see. Yeah. Um, you know, very senior people on the COBRA committee who are doing media interviews from their study, from their library, from their office, from the yeah. hospital ward, yeah. you know, to Chris Whittington, um, doing interviews like that. So that's, a, that's another set of rules. A lot yeah. of the remote interviews that I talked about earlier and Zoom have got, they've got some things in common, but there are some, some strange things about Zoom where you can actually end up doing a really lousy interview kind of because you don't know how to make Zoom work when it comes to media interviews. So yeah. I've had to create media training that can be delivered by Zoom as a result of the pandemic. I've had to master Zoom. I've had to, I've had to learn how to market it and sell my training differently because, um, you know, a lot of what a lot of what I do, you know, 50% of it is word of mouth recommendation. Yeah. Um you know, if you're not going to see people and shake their hand and see the whites of their eyes and get a business card from them, you know, I've had to innovate in terms of m- my business because mm. I've had to be able to, I've had to replace that networking with sort of something, you know, something else, you know, mugging yeah. up for this podcast. You know, I've had to learn how to be a good podcast guest. I've been listening to your back catalogue and oh, taking God, notes don't. and thinking, right, that worked really well. <laughs> You know, I've been learning a lot of it, deploying best practice, you know, when I've yeah. heard, you know, good podcast guests, like, oh, that, you know, that's really, really good. So 
I think as a business owner, I mean, you'll know this wearing your Firefights podcast hat because effectively you're, you know, you're a business. Mm. You need to be quite, you've got to be very deft. You've got to be quick on your feet. So I, I think that sort of, you know, that, that, that development is, is, is sort of, is ongoing and, and, you know, it never, it never stops. You know, I, I no. do, I make myself do 45 minutes of business development every week. Um, and I've got a monster spreadsheet and it's got my hit list of, of you know, of people that I you know, want to train. So I'm doing quite a lot of work in the, in the third sector at the minute, sort of public sector. I need and to charity. formalize that a bit more because like what you say there, there's, there's crossover for me about, um, sectors and, and guests and, and different areas of the most services from frontline mm-hmm. operators to doctors, to paramedics, to, you know, Navy SEALs, mm-hmm. to all this sort of stuff. But sometimes mm-hmm. I, you get that shiny I'm like a blooming magpie. Do you know what I mean? I have to discipline mm-hmm. myself not to rush yeah. from thing to thing mm-hmm. with with the shiny aspects of the things that I see. But I, I love what you said there about. I think there's a there's like a, a wider conversation about. Have you read a book called Winners by Alistair Campbell? Irrelevant of what people do or don't like about Alistair Campbell. Um, no, he talks about strategy versus tactics, and mm-hmm. he correlates this with a lot of people that we perceive as winners. Uh, Alex Ferguson is a big part of it. There's loads of sporting individuals. The Queen is in it, and winners that have lasted the test of time. Time. And the reason they've done that, and the reason that, that I believe it's relevant to what we're talking about there, is because the strategies of what we're talking about haven't changed. The strategies of communication, but the tactics, i.e., the Zoom versus mm-hmm. the social media versus the newspaper versus the tactics have changed. The playground, the playing field, whatever, may look as though it's changed, but many of the overarching strategies, and I feel mm-hmm. that's why the work that you do is still so relevant. Am I reaching there or, or, or does that make sense? No, I mean, there are some eternal truths here. You know, don't tell lies. <laughs> don't be a prat <laughs> with a journalist. These are universal truths. Um, and the sort of the, the, the basic sort of foundation of skills that you get when you finish at half past five or at the end of the Midland Youth Masterclass, it will, will stand you in really good stead for all sorts of situations. It will stand you in good stead if you're in interview. It will stand you in really good stead if you're in front if the sky truck has turned up outside, you know, fire headquarters and yeah. you've been the person that's been shoved out in front of the, the cameras. It will stand you in good stead when you're training. You know, if you're, sta- if you're, if you're um, standing in front of a, a bunch of recruits and you've got to communicate something to them or you need to deal with a mm-hmm. particularly gobby or awkward recruit, these are, these are really universal skills. And, it's all it's rooted in sort of respect, mutual respect. So a journalist is there to do their job. They want to come away with a story. You've got something that you want to communicate to the public. So actually, let's try and find a middle ground where we both get what where we both get what we want. Yeah, and that's where we're, that's what we're sort of aiming for in the middle. But it, you know, it is rooted in those old fashioned values, perhaps of mutual respect. You know, not assuming anything, being do the work. Yes. you know, do the work. Don't just rock up and expect a journalist to give you an easy ride you know it's nothing good comes easy so th- there are some what i would you know old-fashioned you know sort of values in that and i, I sort of make no, no apologies for that and i think that sometimes that doesn't sit well with them um, and it's not like a right old grandma now but it doesn't sit well with the younger generation so i, I when i train sort of tech startups in shoreditch you know uh, this is pre-pandemic. They come in, you know, with a soya latte and a big bushy beard, and they want to know how to get into the FT. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, "Oh no, 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 no! Uh, the people we're looking for read the FT." And I was like, "Right, okay. Well, you know, what are the chances of them picking the FT picking up your story? You're a two-bit startup mm. in the tech startup capital of London and the UK. Yeah. You're two a penny, of mate. Other people doing the same thing. An ocean. Okay. You think you're special. You're actually not that special." And there might be stuff about you that is special. That's what we're teasing out in the How to Do yes. NPR workshop. How do you pitch that story? You know, you have to give them something that they want. It's not enough to think you're marvellous. You quite like no, some free yeah, publicity. Yeah. That's it. It's that, that that's exchange. Not, no, that's that exchange. not how it works. No, there going, is. Oh, you do you want to just take a back. picture of us? Uh, you can take a picture of it. And they're like, yeah, great. Right, now we're on a chat. You go, no, 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 just yeah. just, just, take a picture. We're here. I uh, saw a yeah. group of people doing a uh, charity event uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, well, I helped out mm-hmm. on the charity event. And um, there were some people there and they said, oh, we want to do it in the town centre because that's where we're Mm -hmm. going to get most donations because they wanted to collect some in hand as well. It was for the emergency services. And Mm -hmm. somebody came along and they started taking pictures and talking to people. They were from the media. They had like a a camera person with them. And Mm -hmm. they took loads of pictures. And I said to them, I said, you need to go and talk to that person. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to talk to them because they were walking around. They were talking to the recruits. They were talking to members of the public. They're getting content now. So take control yeah, of the situation right 
and mm-hmm. put, make sure your agenda gets across because they're going to get what they want. They will get something mm-hmm. so that they can build mm-hmm. together a big enough piece to, to present. Mm-hmm. So put yourself in mm-hmm. front of it. You can't just stand there and go, I'll take a picture of us now. No, we're not talking. It's, this is about the charity thing. It's not about me because they, they want to know. So mm-hmm. like you say, empower yourself with those skills and mm-hmm. confront it. Make sure the story is being mm. told because there is going to be a story told. Make sure you've yeah. got some sort of uh, You're in it. involvement mm. in its creation. Yeah, I, I know that the thing thing about charities is that it's not as extreme as the emergency services. The love, okay, journalists will, will, will generally open your emails, read your press releases, will usually do the story. Charities, it's not quite as much of that, but there is a gen, you know, there is a, a genuine warmth. Mm. you know, towards charities as well. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to work for the story. It doesn't mean that you don't have to put a really good press release together. It doesn't mean that you, you can abstain from coming up with multimedia content. We want great pictures. We want, um, I talk about this perfect news package in the How to Do Your NPR workshop. This perfect news package lands in my inbox. I undo the ribbon and everything falls out that I could possibly need. I say, you know, there is work to be done. Okay. If this were easy, I'd be doing this from my private Caribbean island, like Richard Branson. <laughs> I, I have to put the work in because I build people for this. You know, I've got PR clients. You know, it, it's work. You know, you have, to put the, you have to put the time in. You have to put the effort in. It's got to be word perfect. It's got to be the right length. It's got to have be jargon free it's got to have a good quote in it it's all the top 10 tips for press releases that, that i talk about mm. there isn't any quick fix and charities are can be somewhat guilty of that that they you know, oh, we do a really good thing just do a double page spread on us no it doesn't work like that you have to give me enough material in order to be able to do a double page spread on it and some of the guests that you've had on the podcast over over the years you know it's got a firefighter the firefighters charity you know mm. the rescue challenge um, you know, people like Fire Aid, you know, the Air Ambulance, they're all charities. And I, I, these, you know, some of these people are on my hit list to get to. Yeah. So the Fire Service College, the RNLI, the Air Ambulance, mm. you know, United Kingdom Rescue Organization. These are on my hit list of people to get to because I, I think a lot of their stories kind of going honestly, untold. Like the next four months. Yeah. This is where I speak mm. to people about going through the pain as well, because you've got to go through the irrelevance. You've got to be able to trudge mm. through that. That's part of the learning process, isn't it? And especially with something mm. like what you mm. teach, it's a very steep and difficult learning curve before you become mm. relevant. And we're getting to that point now with the podcast where the tide starts turning and we've got a lot of impactful authors that are from the sectors and, and you know being contacted by chiefs of services and, and other people that want to be involved in the emergency services because it's got a massive mm. USP. But that learning curve similar to what you were speaking about there because I think a lot of what you do as well so much of the person is in it because it's a very personal thing it involves the person being able to articulate something so not only are they judging what they do i.e. the police the fire service the, the, also the person feels like they're being judged as a communicator so mm-hmm. I think it's a very challenging learning curve if you haven't got like somebody like yourself a mentor or so to, to hold your hand through some of it one of the things I always say to people is, you know, PR is not a dark art. Um, <laughs> PR is really just communicating with the public. It, you know, it's not alchemy. I'm not a wizard. You know, you can teach some of those skills. And often a lot of the sort of the, the small, small businesses that I train, I train a lot of charities as well. People that come with zero media skills and just know that, you know, a slightly bigger charity than them or one of their competitors got some really good coverage in their local paper and they're proper mad about it and they want yeah. to know how they can do it. It's actually not rocket science, but there is a bit of work that, that, that has to go into it. I mean, I train north of a thousand entrepreneurs every year, mm. either through the How to Do NPR workshop, PR mentoring, PR consultancy. And, you know, you're coming along to one of these How to Do NPR workshops later this year. So you'll that's, get that's the this, this training in action. I say to people, I really value <clears> this to the extent that I'm, I'm booked on to it again myself. It's not somebody I've stumbled across yeah. and gone, I just want a podcast mm. episode and then you can go if you like. I look yeah. forward to being able to attend that as well because it's important for us. Yeah. Because so I can say go over and mm. listen to an hour and a half podcast, but they'll say just send it to us in a brief email. And I'm like, I'm not great at that bit. <laughs> so I, I know what I need to develop in that side of it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think just being able to, you know, the skills that you learn in how to write a really good press release are, again, really transferable. If you can tell your story in 450 words, which is the average length of a page lead mm. in a newspaper. Funnily enough, it's, it's also the fund- average length, mm. by the way, for applications. When people put in applications ah. for jobs and stuff like that, literally, okay. it will say, there we are. here's so, question one, it's a magic number. Five, 500 words is what they get given. Mm. And they have to use a star, yeah. mnemonic and all this sort of stuff. And it's... Uh, yeah. There's so it's, much crossover. If you can't say it in 500 words, then you need to go through it and start cut, cutting back. But that's your, that's your, you know, that's your, your bread and butter way of getting in touch with anybody. Into getting in touch with a, a journalist is your is the humble press release. You master that, 
Mm. You have then now on the way learned how to write a really good blog post. You've learned how to write really compelling newsletter content. You've learned how to write a killer line, which is great for social media to catch people in a sentence or a phrase. Absolutely. So there, there is a lot to be said for actually those DIY PR skills. And again, it's, it's, I mean, you're coming with your firefighters podcast hat on, but I think you will find that perhaps when you bring those skills back to your own brigade, you'll be like, do you know what? We're doing something really, really cool with like a sixth form academy. I mean, you were talking with uh, one of your previous podcast guests uh, about uh, a project that, that you were talking about a project about sort of road safety yeah. where there was some really graphic content and you were going into sixth form colleges to hit that 16 to sort of 20, 21 age group that get get themselves wrapped around trees and die every weekend. Yeah. And having a really impactful presentation Honestly, where you... So make- much of it. There's so much of it, Mary. You're speaking to the choir. I... It's the blooming, it's the fixed mindset gatekeepers, which secretly, it's fear masquerading as logic or what they consider to be mm-hmm. common sense or tradition. And it's just fear. You know, we fear mm-hmm. talking about these things because we worry if we do it wrong. You know, doing nothing, mm-hmm. they think there's no cost in doing nothing. They think, they're like, mm-hmm. back to your no comment. They think there's no concern in saying no comment. They think there's no concern in, but if I do say something, or if I do write something, or if we do record something on video, what if we do it wrong? And for me, I'm like, what mm-hmm. if we don't do it at all? And again, this comes back to mm-hmm. that insignificance piece that there's so much stuff that we can, it's not about me. It's not about any, it's not about, really, you know, it's not about making it the show for me to go and talk about something, just helping somebody else. And that's why I enjoyed what you do so much, helping somebody else share the great work they're already doing it's not a lie it's not a fabrication it's not an exaggeration it's just learning how to communicate it and avoid the pitfalls so the 999 services it's really important you shine a, a light on the great work you do it's also we haven't talked about taxpayers money but let's talk about taxpayers money right now yeah. you need to justify how you're spending taxpayers money okay so we need to get over this sleeping in the day and playing snooker and cards and making really good chili Okay, we need to get past that because you're not doing that. You're actually doing the prevention stuff. You're doing business inspections. You're doing falls prevention. We're doing loads. You're going in. Honestly, there's yeah. so much. There's all loads services of stuff. that everybody's doing stuff. Yeah, fire service. Absolutely, certainly. and you've got to share that that information with readers, listeners, and, and viewers. I mean, mm. you know, you, you, and not you just don't in a big us. data spreadsheet. Not oh, well, we did. We released it on .gov.uk, and we have to put this mm. in because there are quarterly reports. Nobody's going to mm. bloody read it other than no, your colleague no, from the other fire service no. they don't care no and also people don't understand what those no. they can what, what is what is force prevention what you know and why do you care about that i mean what you talked mm. about earlier you gave sort of 30 seconds of catching people early prevention yeah stopping people falling through the cracks yeah. why is that a good thing for the yeah. fire service you, you explained it mm. beautifully i would like to see that in a press release oh, now maybe that's so much i know you're wearing your fire you, can say, you know when you see hat. jen you know you see yeah, Janice from the next door and she's struggling to walk down the path we see a lot of that x was it remember the story when when people mm. make it about a certain thing as well um nobody cared about the um i say nobody exaggerate there was very little concern about uh, BSC, uh, bovine, uh, mad cow disease. Also, just all the agricultural problems we were having. And it was a story that the media captured about the one story about one cow or one calf or one something, wasn't it? It was, um, I may mm. be butchering this, but they make it about a certain person. And you see this with all the live aid and with the charities and stuff. You go, oh, 10,000 mm. people die from hunger. And you go, who cares? And you go, right, now let me say you about Milasev. Do you know what I mean? Let me tell you about her walking 10 miles every day. Bang, we make it personal. You know, giving that story of saying Janice, you know, struggles mm. to get up and down the path. The neighbours had been noticed that she was struggling. They saw the ambulance there one night because she'd had a fall at the front door. And then two weeks later, she died in a fire in the home. We want to prevent that. Mm. And with the, the warning mm. signs were there. It just didn't make its way mm. through. So now what we're doing is falls prevention courses. This is a way for people mm. to get postural stability instruction for them to be able to move more comfortably around the home to identify things that might trip them up. You know, that that bit of carpet that mm. had been hanging up. Well, hang on a minute. Mm. We're not carpet experts. No, we're not carpet experts, but we're trying to create a safe route for that person to exit the home. So you know what? We did go. We did just fix that bit of carpet down and we did just move this. Yeah. Anyway, I'm getting, I'm getting away from myself, but you, when I hear you no, say that, I just want to scream. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that, that's the killer line, isn't it? Firefighter fix carpet to save a life. Yeah. What? Bang. Firefighter. Yeah. The intrigue. I don't know how, what, who, where. Save life. What are you doing? Exactly. That's, that's the killer line. That's, that's the killer line that 
you will write in the House Studio and PR workshop. If you just if you wear your brigade hat rather than your firefighters podcast hat, mm. that's the killer line that I'm looking for. And what we do is everybody that's in the group comes up with a killer line, they read it aloud, and then we decide who's got the best killer line for our mock radio bulletin. So it's actually putting, actually turning something that's an idea yeah. and getting it down to a press release. So actually what you're going to send out to the media. And one of the things that we do in the How to Do and PR Masterclass, which is a follow-on from the How to Do and PR workshop, is we brainstorm the business. And I put you all in a breakout room, and there might be you, there might be somebody that's launching a children's clothing brands there might be a ceo of a charity mm. there might be somebody who's a tech startup and i'll put you all in a room and unleash you on one another and you will brainstorm each other's businesses and come back with three ideas and stories yeah. and you'd be amazed at the stuff that is right under your nose for mm. the firefighters podcast you haven't spotted and somebody said to you pete have you not done a story on that why not and you're like yeah, um yeah, i know i can't really explain why so actually you get a group of entrepreneurs, you get the board you can't afford, basically. You get a group of entrepreneurs that give their insight and their layperson view on, mm. on what it is that you do because, you know, the Firefighters Podcast is a business. Yeah. You've got to run it like a business mm. um, and you've got to get your, there's, you know, if you're not doing any PR, I always say this to my my delegates on the How to and PR workshop, you know, if you're not doing PR, you're kind of missing rocket propellant yeah. in your engine because... Yeah, yeah. I get it. I'm so busy working in the business that you don't work on the business. Yeah, on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, particularly when it's grown like the podcast has. I mean, I haven't told you this, but I'll I'll, I'll make you blush now by telling you this. When when we were training at Isar, we were training in Lincolnshire earlier this year, and I I went in to get a cup of tea, across the tundra, into the canteen, (laughs) and... um, and there were a couple of a couple of firefighters that were on urban search and rescue training. I think they weren't on the media interviews, masterclass training. There weren't any of my delegates, yeah. and they were huddled around their phone. And obviously, one of them had spotted you, and was huddled huddled around their phone. And like, no, it is him. It is. It's definitely him. It's definitely him. As I was making my tea, and like, no, no, it's definitely him. It's the yeah, it's the boat that does the firefighters podcast. It is. And they were all like conferring in whispers, hushed whispers about was it actually you. Had they spotted you on another training course somewhere in uh, the venue where we were training? So actually, if you think about it, you started out with nothing and have grown the audience to such an extent that actually you've got people sort of whispering like they might pap you or try and get a selfie with you. Over a period of I've got to interrupt you because what that is, and this is the whole self-deprecating and all that sort of stuff. It's got it really has got very little to do with me. And I say this honestly because that's the whole point of the podcast. I didn't call it the Pete Wakefield podcast. It's not the Pete Wakefield podcast. It's yeah. about the emergency services. It's only even called the Firefighters podcast because I'm a firefighter. But the success of it so far is down to the fact that the people I get the opportunity to speak to, and here's the blush reversal that includes you, <laughs> because they're so interesting. And I feel like nobody is cheering for them. I always have these conversations anyway. You know, I, I, I pin people down and ask them questions because I find them really interesting. And I think surely there must be more people than just me that find these people interesting. And lo and behold, it's true. You know, a lot of people yeah. want to hear the stories of what it's like to be in charge of a whole police service, what it was like to have the first boots on the ground at 9-11, what it was like to pull that baby out of this wildfires in Greece, you know, whatever it might mm. be. They're the stories and, and, and capturing them in that time capsule. So I, I do thank you for that. And, and I wasn't aware of that. And it is, it's in 70 plus countries now. And I think we just hit 140,000 downloads, which is just obscene. If I tried to picture 140,000 people, I, I don't yeah. know what that looks like. Yeah. But again, it's because... I want to celebrate people and I feel like Mm -hmm. we're not doing it enough, but it's wonderful. I love it. It's crazy. Well, but you're an entrepreneur. I know you might be an entrepreneur by accident, but you are an entrepreneur. Oh yeah. I've done three or four failed things before this as well. (laughs) We've got got two other businesses that are working, but we've had some costly expenses. Well, that makes you a serial entrepreneur then. So, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that needs to go in, in the press release. Well, I'm a recovered addict as well. That's half the problem. So I I realized long ago that it's like a secret superpower, but if I don't funnel it in the right, it's Mm -hmm. like a box of fireworks. I always say, if we set a box of fireworks off in this Mm -hmm. room, we burn the house down. But if we take it outside Mm -hmm. and funnel it in a productive manner you know it, it mm-hmm. might it might take us to the moon for all intents and purpose so 
yeah. I've got that serial relentless desire to add value beyond the limitations of my current environment. Mm -hmm. And the podcast mm -hmm. has just been a wonderful tool to allow me to do that and reach, reach across yeah, yeah. the world. Yeah. I mean, you're sort of growing organically, but I think the power of PR would then... That's exactly why. More exposure. <laughs> That's exactly why I yeah. drew you out, you because I'm like, more, I can't rely yeah. on it organically. There's, there's so many more no, people yeah. can well, benefit get, from this if I speak to people like you and yeah, learn you, how to articulate exactly. it. You, you get so far through organic growth, and then you need to you need to sell yourself. So this is a, it, it, the equivalent of my businesses. 50% of that word of mouth recommendation, gold dust, can't replace it, absolutely invaluable. You know, when I get calls from people, so I've heard you recommended, who recommended you? It's somebody who was in the room seven years ago at a housing yeah. association yeah. that I trained, and they've had three different career changes since then. And seven years on, they still think that I'm good enough to, in order to recommend to somebody who they hold dear, who like, they're only going to recommend good people to, otherwise it makes them look bad. That's seven years on. That's at the absolute gold dust, but then you can't just bank on that. So yeah. the doing PR around the Firefighters podcast will... You, you know, you might have people coming to you saying, can you have me on as the guest? And you're like, wow, yeah. I would love to have yeah. you on as the guest. So they're coming to you also attracting advertisers. You know, this has got to make money. This has got to wipe its own face. Mm -hmm. You know, you can attract a wider range of, you know, you can you can massively increase the audience. And, and PR is that kind of magic ingredient. I mean, I'll give you an example. It's an extreme example, but it's one that I share. I'm pre-pandemic. I used to do a lot of how to do and PR tasters. So I would go and be an expert speaker at Chamber of Commerce or Federation of Small Business or university uh, startup programs. And I would talk just, you know, I would cover my top 10 tips for press releases, which is one of the foundation stones of learning in the house doing PR workshop and I do a little bit of chat and I do an introduction and mm -hmm. I get people to talk about what was newsworthy in their business. So half an hour, 45 minutes. And I used to do a lot of training in the city business library in, in London. And I would, I remember training there, doing a pace session one day and, did my introduction at the beginning and was saying, you know, why are you here? Why are you here? So inevitably there are people that you think you've only come for a warm and to see if there's any free sandwiches. <laughs> we'll put you to one. I mean, I'll train anybody, but yeah. you can see them. There must have been a secret thing them. that happened within you as well there because, uh, and I was spoken about <laughs> your personal development, but you were so used to being the writer, the question asker, the person behind mm. or next to the camera that must have been a bit of a role reversal and change of personal, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe fears, perceptions, to put yourself up front and center and go, actually, I love sharing other people's stories, but the fact I'm very good at doing that is because I've worked on these things and this is how I can help you do the same. That must have been the first time you got up and spoke in some of these entrepreneurs, or did it just come naturally? Well, it's one of, it, ha it, it happened gradually because I, when I left full-time news reporting, um, you know, I was the youngest person to take voluntary redundancy at my, at my paper at that time, just some sort of raised eyebrows. But I knew that I was going to do, um, I was doing a lot of media training um, mm. uh, at the time with some government departments, you know, really big, significant household names. So I knew that I had a buffer, to go, I had a, had a good sort of launch pad to go from. Yeah. Um, and I always knew I wanted to sort of share my wisdom, secrets from the newsroom type thing. Um, and it sort of evolved from there. It was a very sort of slow sort of build. And then, you know, the first time I had an audience when literally everyone was hanging off my words, this was all new to them, all the stuff that was bleed and obvious to me about, yeah, you know, yeah. how not to tick a journalist off and say thanks and all those things. <laughs> well, I, they were lapping it up, absolutely lapping it up. I thought, I'm onto something here, bloody hell. And I've actually turned it, I've actually turned it into a business. Mm. So I think, I think that's quite, I think that's I, it's definitely something I've hit on something there. And to go back to the City Business Library, there was a, I was doing my introduction at the beginning and I thought, well, why are you here? And, you know, various answers. And then I got to somebody and she said, um, I'm here because... 18 months ago, uh, my business, which is called Russian Paralegals, got a one-word mention in The Economist, and it was a one-word mention. They were doing an interview with a high court judge, and this high court judge happened to name check us. And we have had 18 months' worth of a full order book as a result of that. Wow. We're at, at that one-off piece of PR coverage that we had no control over. It just landed like a gift. I said, I want to know how to get that for myself. Yeah. So that's a really extreme example, but that is why if you are a small business, if you are a charity, I don't think there's anybody that this, that, that, that having those PR skills wouldn't be useful to. So whether mm -hmm. you're on, you're the chairman of the, your local, your lo of your kid's PTA, 
you're you're involved in the sailing club, you're involved in raising money for cancer research, whatever. These skills are really, really useful. How to write a really good press release, how not to tick a journalist off, how to get in their good books, do's and don'ts, insider secrets, all of those things. So we're talking there about sort of things that people would have benefited from long back. And one of my other personal questions to you is, from your sort of world in in, in media, what are one of the things that you wish you'd have known when you joined the sector? How to network better, because people buy from people. And if people buy into you and they believe what you say, they are much more willing to part with money to come and learn some more. So I hadn't realised it took me sort of trial and error. It took me a couple of years to realise that actually doing how to do your NPR tasters, where I give away some of my content for free in front of an audience, is a way to drum up business for paid for places on my how to do your NPR workshop. I've got better at that over the years. Now, I'd say I'm actually a pretty good networker. Um, you've got to get yourself out there. You've got to get people have got to hear you and see you, and you've got to be able to demonstrate. It's not enough to say it for me to say, oh, I'm a really good, I'm a PR guru. Yeah. You know, that's all the blah, 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 blah. Okay, <laughs> show me that you know what you're talking about. So how I do that is the how to do NPR tasters. Yeah. And I think a lot, um, you know, because the, you know, the emergency services, it's a family. Um, yes. There's so much, you know, people move from brigade to brigade. They move from, you know, um, you know comms people move across the three services. Yeah. They bring their little black book of contacts with them. You know, I've got a couple of comms people who you know i I think i've trained like three or four of different emergency services because every time they move and they go in and do an audit and they're like oh my god you haven't done any media training yeah. you know the fire chief is doing interviews without a parachute yeah. let's get mary in i think it's so, so important now like because there's so much turnover i think mm-hmm. i said this when we we're off the call um mm-hmm. so much turnover in staff were recruiting so heavily mm-hmm. so people are yeah. ascending corporate structures and public sector quickly. structures quickly yeah. Mm-hmm. And we're missing mm-hmm. a lot of those development pieces that would have traditionally yeah. come over time. They find themselves in a position mm-hmm. where they are incredibly exposed. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you next, what is on the on the counter side of it? What's a really common piece of advice you think people should ignore? That the traditional media is dead. I see a lot of fatalism about traditional media, particularly when I train anybody under the 40. I don't read the papers. I don't watch the news. I don't know what channel Sky is on a lot of sort of people just completely disengaging from the traditional media. Mm -hmm. That's a trend. It's a thing, which is why traditional media are very keen to get the audience that is on Twitter, that is on Facebook. So, you know, all the nationals, all of the regional press have got an online presence. They've got really good websites. They've got really good social media channels. And that is simply not true that the traditional media is dead. And People often conclude that it's all about, every, you know, where it's at is social media influencers, bloggers. That's where it's at. They have encroached on the traditional media's audience, but the traditional media is still important. And you ignore them at your peril, is what I would say. Yeah. Okay, you ignore them at your peril. <laughs> so it's all very well getting into bed with some influencer, okay, that you think is going to raise the profile of your business 500%. But the thing that traditional media gives you, and traditional media I'm talking about print, online, radio and telly. So I'm talking about your BBC Radio Stoke. I'm talking about your Granada reports. I'm talking about your Manchester Evening News, your Glasgow Herald, the Sale Advertiser. And I'm talking about things like the Huffington Post. Okay, that's yeah. when I'm talking about traditional media. You get a mention on there and that is a third party endorsement. It's publicity that money can't buy. I have made buying decisions based on what I have read, listened to, or watched. I bought my the car that I had before this one based on a page three story in the Metro about the greenest cars on the UK roads. Yeah, I, I made a very five-figure buying purchase, buying decision based on something I read in Metro. Mm. I won't be the only one that does that. And I, oh, I've God, done no. that knowing. It works, because it works. How Everybody the media works. It. Yeah. Yeah, it does. So actually, getting that, because the traditional media has sort of rules and parameters, okay, believe it or not, we don't just write or publish anything that we like, okay, in the way that you can get away with seeing on social media and blog posts and influencers. There are checks and balances. So there is a third party endorsement. So actually, the traditional media is not dead, okay? So and anyone that's telling you that is, is actually selling you a mistruth. It sits alongside... Mm the new emerging media, and often the two cross over. So you will see, I don't know, <clears throat> newspapers, I'm thinking of the, the, the ones that I've worked for, that are traditional, 
print publications, they do a daily edition, they print every day, but their social media is on fire. Yeah. Their social media is on app absolutely on fire and you are getting a massive audience following their social media that don't read the paper don't buy the paper yeah. but they are still being exposed to that content mm -hmm. from that traditional media outlet so i think to think that you know forget about dft forget about um radio lancashire forget about uh, the Liverpool Echo. I, I think that's foolish, and I think you know traditional media is is not dead. It needs some some assistance, I think, and I think it doesn't have the audiences that it did twenty thirty years ago. No. But I think to dismiss it as dead, I think is you're missing a trick. Basically, mm. don't you know you get yourself on central news with your charity project or your business, and you can watch the phone ring, and you can see your website traffic yeah. quadrupling, and you can see the orders and customers coming in. Yeah. Okay, that, that's, that's what happens. So ignore it at your peril. My final question is those essential characteristics. What are the essential characteristics to be a great communicator? I think you need to work at it because there are very few natural orators. The rest of us who aren't natural orators have got to put the preparation and the practice in. So I've probably spent half a day prepping for this podcast. I've done my homework. I've done more than half a day in terms of listening to a back catalogue. So I practice what I preach. I'm just rocked up here and hope for the best. Mm. I've rocked up here, having done my preparation, looking at what I want to cover. I've responded to your questions. You know, we talked about the areas you wanted to cover. So I've gone away. I want to give you the best possible, you know, I want to be one of your star guests. Yeah. I don't presume that I'm going to be your star guest without putting the work in. So I do actually practice what I preach. And if you want to be a good communicator, you have to work at it. You've got to put in the preparation. The other thing I always say to people is that when they come out of the end of the day, at half to five, at the end of the media interviews masterclass, that they don't then just shelve the paperwork. So I give you a handout, don't I, at the start of the day and people yes, scribble notes. Absolutely. And I, I worry about how many of those get put on a shelf and gather dust for the next three years. If you don't use it, you lose it. Mm. And I would say to people, as those opportunities come up, let's grab them with both hands. And you've got to keep it simple, stupid. Kiss. Keep it simple, Keep stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. That's one of my... So yeah. There's two things there. That's one of the things I've got printed on one of my cards. But what you said about those, mm -hmm. and I hate what I'm about to do. You know when people tell you how to run your business? Ugh, I hate that. But mm -hmm. you know the uh, when you said you gave us that content <laughs> and then um, you said don't leave it on your shelf, make sure you use it. Mm -hmm. What I actually did is I came home and created a small card on my PC, printed, mm -hmm. uh, printed it off and laminated mm -hmm. it and put it in my wallet so that... Mm -hmm. If I am presented with mm -hmm. those moments, which I am regularly, mm -hmm. then it's there and I can and I can have a quick review of it. And I thought to myself, because I was going to do it anyway, and I thought to myself, I'll make yeah. sure I mention it to Mary because I'm like, yes, this should that's have a good idea. this should have your mm -hmm. name on the back of it and the front of it. Mm -hmm. So when somebody gets it out mm -hmm. when they're prepping for that um, media interview, and somebody mm -hmm. goes, that's good. What's that? And then they see the person at the mm -hmm. bottom, and they go, and they go, oh, this is a course. You know, a lady called Mary delivered it to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic. This is like my savior card that i get out yeah. to quell my nerves and re re an reinforce yeah. the break glass and emergency mm -hmm. and i carry them i carry lots mm -hmm. of little things like that because they, mm -hmm. they just help me and i can fiddle with mm -hmm. them in my fingers um, in my pocket and then glance at it before i do something mm -hmm. but yeah essential mary i'm gonna write that down <laughs> there you go. I'm, 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 I'm glad you've taken some benefit machine. from this. You've given, they're called. <laughs> you've given so much. I'm sure there'll be a company out there that will just do a million of these cards for something. But um, I hope so. Thank you so much for your time. I'm glad you've taken away even a small amount of value because I know you've given it in absolute spades. We have beautifully gone in so many different directions, which I always is what I love about our conversations. We have a brief outline of, of a structure we want to follow. And then off we go and, and sprint across the playground, um, go onto the swings when we had the, the slide in mind originally. But that's what I love about it. I sincerely look forward to uh, doing our, you know, how to do great PR. I know we've got that coming up or our PR, not, not, it's not a masterclass, but the written word is something. Mm. I have got the biggest from and to gap that I look to hopefully close in the future. And I've still got a from and to gap with, with the audible factor. I interrupted you far too much during our conversation today, but thank you so much. You know, given everything we've spoken about today, I want people to be chomping at the bit and we're going to put the LinkedIn, the website, everything in below, but what is your preferred way? What is the best way for people to reach out and engage with you? Well, people can reach me on the website, which is www.marymurtermedia.co.uk. Go and have a poke about, read the testimonials, look at the course content, have a look at pricing, look at who else I've worked for. Go and skulk, which is what people sometimes do, new clients do. They go and have a skulk. 
and by the time we have a conversation, they already have sort of know which course they want, mm. elements of it that they really want to focus on. Um, they've got an idea of how many people they want trained. They sort of know what their budget is. And they've had a look on LinkedIn, had a look at the testimonials, and sort of I've really kind of decided that they want me to, live, to deliver some training. And they've done that before they even, before they even reach out. So yeah. I would encourage people to do that. Poke about, skulk, read up, have a look at what I do and who I work for, and then just send me an email. Um, I'm more than happy to have a no obligation chat with people. It's not a timeshare. I'm not going to try and sell you anything. <laughs> We're just going to have a, a bit of a chat to scope out what it is you need. So perhaps it's your SLT team that really you've got some gaps. Okay, the head of finance is scared to this as the media and really needs to get over that. Perhaps you've got a storm brewing. You know there's going to be a kickoff in the next six months and you need to make sure that you're ready for that kickoff. It could be something more basic. Yeah. So it could be the RNLI, the Air Ambulance, Firefighters Charity, Rescue Challenge, World Rescue Organization, Fire Aid, United Kingdom Rescue Organization that want to up their game in terms of their PR skills and perhaps they need to get along to a how to do your own PR workshop. Sometimes people come to me with, with uh, we think about projects, we need this, actually have a chat with them and actually they don't need that, they need the other thing. Yeah. But that's where those conversations are really useful. Absolutely love it. Mary, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy day. You know, I think opening ourselves up getting over ourselves there is so much more benefit out there to be had and it outweighs what people fear is the cost of communicating more and communicating more effectively which is exactly what you've given us the tools to do thanks so much for having me pete it's been a pleasure thanks mary i'll speak to you soon bye bye now well boys and girls that was my conversation with mary murtar Again, everything we've discussed will be in the notes below. If you want to jump over and find out more about Mary, you can go to Mary Murtagh. That's M-U-R-T-A-G-H. That's Mary Murtagh Media.co.uk, where you can delve into that personal development, see how these skills give that big crossover to you and your company and your organization. If you're still listening now, then I know full well you've seen some benefit of some of the things that we've been discussing with Mary. Now really think to yourself about the strategies we need to apply to get that great communication and how the tactics now may have appeared to have changed, but so many of these themes still correlate. Mary is working with thousands of people every single year and they are taking that learning and knowledge and education development back to their organizations, being able to communicate their stories more powerfully, avoid the pitfalls and feel confident to share the great work that they're doing. Remember, the best way to support the podcast is to go over and check out our partners. And once again, a massive thank you for coming back to the Firefighters Podcast. Really appreciate your time. Really appreciate your support. We do not take it for granted. You have invested time in today's episode, and I hope your investment has paid you back heavily. I know if you have really focused in on the takeaways that Mary shared with us, and some of that will serve you for many years to come. So look after yourselves, support each other, support your local emergency services wherever you are in the world. And until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry, and I will see you again real soon right here on the Firefighters Podcast. Mm-hmm.